Good evening and welcome to Roosevelt House. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm Katrina Avia, Human Rights Program Associate here at Roosevelt House. We are so thrilled to be partnering with Solidarity Engineering and the Here For Her campaign, which has been spearheaded by Charlie Legrese, who for the past few years has been a very active student and member of the Human Rights Program, as well as the CUNY Graduate Center. And I have the pleasure of introducing her this evening. Following a chance encounter with Solidarity Engineering co-founder Chloe Rastatter, she learned of the lack of humanitarian aid being provided to asylum seekers at the Texas-Mexico border. As their friendship and now partnership has evolved, she began to see how much important work Solidarity Engineering has been doing to provide basic needs to support thousands of displaced people. She also learned of the gravity of the challenges faced by displaced women and girls who are forced to live without access to adequate reproductive care what that means for their health, and what that means for their future once they arrive to the United States. She decided to find a way to make use of her network here in New York to support Solidarity Engineering and bring visibility to the issue itself. It's been a project in the making since November of last year, one that has led to the founding of Here For Her, an initiative geared towards helping women and girls in critical need, women and girls whose voices are not being heard. In honor of Women's History Month, and being that the 67th session of the UN's Commission on the Status of Women is taking place as we speak, we are so glad to be raising awareness for this critical issue and to be amplifying the voices and stories of migrant women and girls tonight. And with that, I turn it over to Charlie Legrese. Thank you, Katrina, and thank you for your help and so much help in setting this up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, wow, it's really nice to see so many familiar faces in here, um, some faces who have traveled across the country and across the entire world. Um, yeah, um, so before we get into it, I just wanted to um, say a special thanks to uh, Roosevelt House for letting us use this beautiful historic space where much of the UDHR came to life in the Four Freedoms speech, so it couldn't be more perfect. Um, and she's not here tonight, but I think she's gonna be zooming in. I have to give a special shout out to Jessica Newarth, who runs the program here and is an incredible human rights defender for many, many decades and has been a huge support in us getting this off the ground and just to me in general for figuring out this crazy human rights environment anyway. Um, and also there was a lot of here for her talk going on just now and I just really, really wanna Mention has been a huge honor working with Solidarity who are actually doing all of this work we're trying to support. Um, as you may know, there's, there's very little uh, humanitarian support going to the border right now. And this, I wanted to bring up this situation in New York because something that really stood out to me with meeting Chloe was that the issues that women and girls are facing at the border don't stop at the border. They continue on throughout the journey and this is really apparent in New York as well with wi what women are going through. Um, and yeah, just being a part of the UNCSW week, I wanted to touch on that real quick because in the free moments, Chloe and I have been getting involved and meeting people from all over the world representing NGOs here. Um, and something that really seems to be coming up a lot is the, inter the intersectionality of women's rights and the way in which, you know, we all know this situation right now that we're talking about is an immigration issue, as, but it's also a climate change issue, it's a tech issue, it's an everything issue, and I just think that we need to really acknowledge that we need to be approaching women and girls' rights with this in mind and just understand what the ripple effect is if we don't. Um, so with that in mind, we just wanted to start off with a little uh, video presentation uh, dear friend, uh, photojournalist Vero is here, also came up from Texas, and is sharing her work with us today. Um, we're just gonna watch a little video so you can get an idea of what people are living through.
So um, that should give you a little bit of a visual understanding, but we just wanted you to get kind of get there before we go into this talk tonight. Um, so just to start us off, um, Chloe Rastatter, co-founder of Solidarity Engineering. God. <laughs> Um, this is Katia Martinez. Um, Katia is actually able to speak to the real experience of what a woman goes through, and Katia has lived in the camps of Reynosa and is going to share her, some of her story tonight. Um, and we have Lupe Rodriguez from the National Latina Institute of Reproductive Care, Healthcare. Um, and um, yeah, we were really, really grateful because they came through at the last minute and we were wanting them to join us from the beginning. <laughs> and we also have the amazing Jennifer Harbury who has also flown in from Texas and has been doing her amazing work at the border for decades. And she's gonna share some stuff too. So um, the first thing we wanted to go over is we just wanted to talk about and have everyone share some of the challenges that they've been experiencing at the border. And also, Lupe can typically speak for both sides, some of the challenges women are going through when they get to New York City. So Chloe. Hello. Is this on? OK. Yeah, it's on. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Chloe Rastatter, and I am a co-founder of Solidarity Engineering. Solidarity Engineering is a women-founded, women-led humanitarian engineering organization working at the U.S.-Mexico border to provide emergency services and help build shelters on the Mexican side. We work in Matamoros, Mexico, and Reynosa, Mexico, which is on the most eastern point of the border in the state of Tamaulipas. The state of Tamaulipas, for a little bit of context, is, a, is rated as a level four do not travel um, security advisory by the US Department of State. This is due to high, high incidences of violence, which you will definitely hear about tonight, um, but includes, but is not limited to rape, kidnapping, extortion, murder. And it happens to be where the epicenter of the humanitarian crisis has been occurring for the past few years. And so before we get too much into the stories, I figured I would set some context for you all. The current situation in these areas is quite dire. Solidarity engineering, you might ask, what do engineers have to do in spaces of displacement? And the answer is environmental health. We work really closely with doctors, specifically Doctors Without Borders, because basically anywhere there's a doctor, there should also be an engineer. Doctors can treat the symptoms of disease, whereas engineers treat the cause. So Doctors Without Borders can spend much a lot of time and a lot of money treating thing, treating people for not having access to clean water. Solidarity Engineering will go in and treat the water so people don't get sick to begin with. We have been working at the border for three years. We were founded in 2020 in response to the very first um, migrant camp in Matamoros, Mexico. And we focus on basic services, so that includes water, sanitation, and hygiene, or wash, infrastructure and consumables, play and education, because there's very few slash no access to play and education for the kids, site infrastructure and planning, and then finally advocacy, because we recognize and know that humanitarian aid is definitely just a Band-Aid solution to these really complex problems. And so, what does the border look like right now? If you're going to take a snapshot, sh snapshot of Solidarity Engineering's work, we are currently providing access to critical wash infrastructure for about 10,000 people a month. To put that in perspective, when we started Solidarity Engineering, we, we were giving services to about 450 people. So within a series of less than three years, actually a closer to two years, we have gone from providing services to 300 to 450 people to 10,000. That being said, we are not providing nearly enough services for these populations, and these spaces are experiencing intense, intense water scarcity, food insecurity, land scarcity, shelter scarcity, energy scarcity, technology scarcity. Basically, anything you can imagine, there's not enough of at the border. 
things haven't always been this bad. Um, and to understand how we got to this point, you have to kind of go back in time a little bit. So the, the turning point of the border, one of the turning points, I should say, was March of 2020. As we all remember, there was a global pandemic or something that shook the whole world. And one of the policies that came out of it was Title 42, which at the time closed the border to asylum. And during this period, uh, we saw a shift in the border in the sense that the epicenter of the humanitarian crisis became the Rio Grande Valley. The Rio Grande Valley is a very impoverished area. The median income of Brownsville, which is the city across the Rio Grande from uh, Matamoros, Texas, the median income is $20,000. The median income of McAllen, right across from Reynosa, is $22,000. So there's really not a lot of resources. And we saw a massive, massive increase in needs in this region. There was a 508% increase in encounters in the Rio Grande Valley between the fiscal year of 2020 and 2021. And this happened to coincide with a simultaneous sharp decrease in resources. During this period, the Biden administration took over. And within a fir the first 100 days of the Biden administration, they basically came in and there was the camp that Solidarity started in the Matamoros camp. And I'm not gonna romanticize this camp. I would never, ever want to live there. I would never want my family to live there. I would never want my worst enemy to live there. That being said, there were showers, there were bathrooms, there was water, there was hand washing stations, there was a playground, there was a school. Unfortunately, in March of 2021, um, the Biden administration came through. Well, fortunately, they allowed the processing of the individuals living inside of the camp so they could cross and apply for asylum. But they simultaneously bulldozed the entire camp, which had over a million dollars of, inf of uh, infrastructure and support put into it over its lifespan. After the bulldozing of the camp, this is when things kind of just spiraled, essentially. The camp was bulldozed, but Title 42 was left in place. And so the only space in the entire area that could take more displaced people was completely lost. And so organizations were forced to entirely start over and we've never been able to recover. We now work in Reynosa, Mexico, which is the next city over. After the Matamoros camp was bulldozed in March of 2021, a new camp was created within a month in Reynosa, 40 miles down the road in a much more dangerous area in a much smaller area. To put it in perspective, the Matamoros refugee camp was 47,500 square meters. The plaza, 5,000 square meters, 3,000 people living there on the size less than a standard soccer field. As this problem got pushed into Matamoros, or from Matamoros into Reynosa, and as the Biden administration took hold, we unfortunately saw an intense decrease in resources. And this has not stopped since the beginning of 2021. Unfortunately, the bulldozer of the Matamoros camp was not the first, and that this was not the last bulldoze bulldozing that we've seen over the past few years. And now we're stuck in a cycle at the border where camps are built, bulldozed, and organizations lose everything. We restart and we keep getting pushed back into a more and more dangerous area in a smaller, smaller area. And so you might wonder, what does this have to do with reproductive health? And what does this actually look like? First off, imagine being pregnant or on your period and not having access to water, not having access to a bathroom, to a toilet paper, to a shower. Unfortunately, this is the reality for approximately 10,000 people. And even when there is access, access is incredibly, incredibly limited. When we interviewed people in Matamoros who are living in one of the camps, because now the problem has grown to the point where we're not going Matamoros, like Reynosa, Matamoros, we're now spread between two cities. And when we interviewed people in the Matamoros camp in January, we asked women, are you able to safely manage your periods? And 100% of women said no, that they didn't have access to materials and infrastructure to manage their periods. The other thing with this is wash infrastructure disproportionately affects women because 
they're incredibly dangerous places for women in areas of displacement. When you're in the bathrooms and showers, these are some of the only times that you're alone. And so the incidences of sexual assault and sexual violence without, in spaces without access to safe wash infrastructure are unfortunately really, really high. And so we're now in a position where 100% of women are telling us they can't safely manage their periods. 5,000 people in the Matamoros camp in January shared eight porta potties. In the Rio camp, we have 10 porta potties for 1,200 people and one make makeshift shower. You might wonder how, how did this happen? And I want to note that all of the photos that you saw, when you see a river, that's the Rio Grande. So the US is literally within eyesight of these spaces. And there's kind of three main reasons as to why this has happened over the past few years and why things have gotten as bad as they are. The first and primary one, which I am making my own personal mission to try to address, is nobody wants to take accountability for these populations. Normally, in places of displacement and during emergencies, there's large international institutions that come in and provide basic resources so organizations like Solidarity don't have to. Unfortunately, organizations like the UN, UNHCR, IOM, UNICEF, Red Cross, International R Rescue Committee are all absent from these spaces. And they're not absent because they don't know. I am in meetings with them. They are very aware of the situation. But due to increasing political tensions and a lot of complex global dynamics, they haven't come. And so this has put the accountability for these people on small organizations. The US government is not funding these spaces. The UN is not funding these spaces. The Mexican government is not funding these spaces. These, these spaces are almost entirely funded by humanitarian aid. And we've seen a sharp decrease over the past year with multiple organizations pulling out because they can no longer afford their projects. So the first one, the first reason why we're here is no accountability. Nobody's wanting to take accountability for these people. The second, op the second reason is media. Media has largely disappeared from these spaces through the changes of administration. And when media is present now, it's often confusing. The different sides are saying different things and neither of them are quite accurate about the situation. And so when I talk to people, I find that they don't even realize that the situation is what it is. People don't understand or don't know that these spaces are not funded, that there's not water, that there's not bathrooms, that there's not school, that there's not playgrounds, but yet there's thousands of people here in very vulnerable situations. And the third and final thing that has caused this comes as a part of the confusing media part, is philanthropy has essentially completely disappeared. All organizations that I know of have lost major donors who are donating to the border, and organizations who are well-funded have pulled out over the past year to focus on other things because they don't see this as an emergency problem. We get told that we can't get funded because you know, development people will look at our projects and say, no, that's an emergency, you need emergency funding. Emergency people will look at us and say, no, that's development, you need development funding. This has been years of a problem. I've been told specifically by somebody who really tried hard to get us funded that when he sent the, our proposals all around that conservative donors won't even touch it and liberals make it squeam it, the, it makes liberals squeamish. And he was sorry, but he couldn't get any of our projects funded. And so what this looks like now is organizations are actively, actively out of money. We are no longer able to provide water, bathrooms, showers, things like this. And when you look at human rights, we have all one shared human right that I specifically am interested in, and that's the right to health. The right to health also includes environmental health, which is things like water and bathrooms. You cannot have your health and the health of a population without basic necessities. And this right should be respected, and unfortunately, it's entirely violated at the border. The spaces that we work in are incredibly difficult to work in. And 
The stories that you're gonna hear tonight are incredibly hard to hear. They're really hard to work around, and that doesn't even compare to actually living it. And at this point, hundreds of thousands of people have gone through these systems, and hundreds of thousands will continue to go through these systems as things like climate change, political instability, and global inequity due to COVID continue to grow. So I wanna thank you all for coming here and spending some of your time to learn about the situation at the border. I know, based on talking to many people, that the, the situation isn't as bad as it is, is be because people don't care. It's as bad as it is because people don't know. So thank you for showing up and spending your time to learn. <laughs> Hola, mi nombre es Katia Martinez. Hello, my name is Katia Martinez. And by the way, I'm, I'm going to be translating for Katia, as you can see. Soy de Honduras. Um, viví en Reynosa, en Reynosa, Matamoros, por ocho meses con mi hija. I'm from Honduras, and I lived in Reynosa, Matamoros, for eight months with my daughter. Quiero compartir mi historia. Quiero decir que, como inmigrante que soy, quiero decir que no es un fuego inmigrar. I want to share my story, and as an immigrant, I want to say that it's not, uh, it's not a game to be an immigrant. Tomar el riesgo de salir de mi país y cruzar México no fue nada fácil. Taking the risk to leave my country and cross Mexico was, was not easy. Viví en la plaza por casi ocho meses con mi hija. Y siempre hay una razón por la cual un inmigrante decide salir de su país. En mi caso, yo salí porque, bueno, mi vida corría peligro. Mi hija fue abusada. Y... Y pues yo como madre quería salvar la vida de mi hija y quería tener mi vida segura. I lived in the plaza for almost eight months with my daughter. And there's always a reason why people leave their country uh, and, and immigrate. For me, it was fear for my life and, and my daughter's. My daughter was abused and uh, I wanted to escape a situation and give her a better life. Eso fue algo muy duro para mí como madre. Creo que todavía no lo puedo superar. It was something really difficult for me as a mother and something that I still don't think I'm over. Mi experiencia en Reynosa, eh, mientras estuve ahí, puedo decir que fue una, una, una situación muy difícil. No tenía como bañarme, dormía en una tienda de campaña. My situation in Reynosa was incredibly difficult. I didn't have anywhere to shower. I lived in a tent. Días comíamos, días no comíamos. Some days we ate, some days we didn't. Pero gracias a Dios que encontré la oportunidad de trabajar, de colaborar con GMR. Uh, but thank God I was able to collaborate and work with GMR. Es una organización que ayuda a los inmigrantes con la salud. It's an organization that helps immigrants with their health. Y... Y pues aprendí mucho ahí. Había muchas historias que me impactaban, que inmigrantes salían de sus países, de diferentes países, y de repente salían con su cuerpo completo y cuando ya llegaban a Reynosa, a la frontera, ya llegaban con un pie cortado, sin un brazo, o habían sido abusados o violados. I learned so much from my work there, and I, something that struck me was that People would leave their country with their bodies intact, but arrive at the border maimed with, without an arm, without a leg, um, incomplete. Y eso es algo que a mí me impactó mucho. It's something that impacted me very much. So, yo, yo pasé por mucho, pero no se compara a, lo, a otras historias que yo, vi, que yo vi con mis ojos, lo que los inmigrantes pasan en la frontera el no tener agua, eh, saber que los pueden secuestrar, porque a mí, yo corrí el riesgo de ser secuestrada con mi hija. I experienced so much, but it didn't compare often to, to what I saw others experience. Um, I, I know that 
these things happen to a lot of people, and even I was uh, potentially uh, a victim of, of kidnapping, um, and and you know was able to live or was able to not have the experience, but I, I know that it happened to others. Entonces, lo que quiero decir es de que uh, a pesar de que a pesar de que eh, pasé por esa situación, eh, no, me, no, me, no me detuve, le doy gracias a Dios que estoy acá y que um, hay personas allá que son miles y miles de mujeres que están padeciendo abusadas sexualmente, familias los están matando porque no tienen el dinero para pagarles a los gangueros. Despite everything, I'm, I'm, I thank God that I'm here. I think there are so many thousands of women and families um, in, in our countries who are uh, experiencing really difficult things, who are at the hands of the gangs, um, and, and I'm, I'm grateful that I'm here. En la frontera, pues, no es, no es un lugar bonito. Créame, créame que no es un lugar bonito estar en la frontera. Tener que hacer largas filas para conseguir un plato de comida. Tener que estar bajo el sol todo el día. Durante la noche, que te caiga la lluvia, el sereno. Eh, corre, tu vida corre mucho peligro porque tú no sabes qué va a pasar al día siguiente. Tú no sabes si vas a amanecer vivo. Believe me, it's incredibly difficult to be at the border, too. Uh, having to wait in line for hours for a plate of food, not having food, being in the sun all day, being exposed to the elements like rain, uh, going to bed and not knowing if you'll wake up the next day, um, it's, it's really difficult. O si vas, o si te vas a dormir, no sabes si te van a llevar a tu hijo, porque todo eso pasó, todo eso yo lo vi, eh, llegaban a la, a la plaza, uh, te arrebataban a tu hijo de tus manos y tú no, te, no podías hacer nada. Y si tú hacías algo, te pueden pegar un tiro. Or even wondering if, if your children are going to be taken away from you. I saw that with my own eyes, people uh, having their children taken away and, and not being able to do anything for fear of being shot or being hurt. Ese lugar yo no se lo recomiendo ni a mi peor enemigo. I don't wish that on my worst enemy. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend it to my worst enemy. Ni, ni a mí, no quisiera ni que mi familia viviera ahí, ni que mis amigos vivieran ahí. No quisiera que nadie viviera en esa plaza. Eso no es un lugar seguro. I, I don't wish that on anybody. I don't wish anybody to live in that plaza. It's, it's not a safe place. Um, yo les comparto esta historia y quiero darle gracias por venir y, y me gustaría que realmente nos apoyaran. Uh, I'm really grateful that you're here and that I'm asking, I, I would love for your support with this and that's why I'm sharing my story today. Thank you, gracias Katia. Hi everybody, um, sorry I'm a little. <laughs> um, my name is Lupe Rodriguez and uh, I'm the executive director of the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice. Um, we go by Latina Institute for short, and our website is latinainstitute.org if you're interested in learning more. Um, we are a national organization that works on reproductive justice issues centering the Latino, uh, Latina and Latinx community in the US. Um, our work is uh, done through in three ways. We are a, a policy advocacy organization um, that does work in DC. We also do uh, policy advocacy work in four states and, and organizing work in four states, uh, Texas, in the Rio Grande Valley, um, in Florida, in Virginia, and in New York currently. And our work is, um, and then our, our third area of work is around culture shift and, um, and you know, conversations really uh, combating narratives that exist around the Latino community, uh, the Latina and Latinx community uh, related to reproductive health and rights uh, and, and justice issues. And we are uh, al almost 30 years old um, and do a lot of work uh, with immigrant communities in the US, with, with in communities that have been displaced and, uh, and elevating that as part of a conversation around reproductive justice. So I think the story that Katya shared about uh, family separation, about the fear that, that, uh, that many of our migrant communities face uh, is one that we recognize persists in the US. Um, one of the things that, uh, to this question about like what we are thinking about are the challenges in this moment for displaced communities um, is very much uh, an, a specter of fear um, that uh, persists, I think, from, from, I think, 
the, the story that Katya shared about the experience and trauma that brings so many people to our borders persists once they're able to, to be in this country even, right? And, and the continuation of discrimination, of um, uh, marginalization, of uh, you know, inequity that, that they face here, even, even for individuals who are migrants, who are immigrants, who have been here for many years. Our work is very much uh, centered around those intersections and thinking through how those communities are uh, and their experiences are brought to the fore uh, when we're talking to policymakers about issues that have to do with reproductive rights and health. Um, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't state that right now in, in this country, of course, we've suffered a huge retrogression uh, in terms of our um, you know, the governmental uh, policy protections around access to abortion care, and I think that that's a huge challenge. Uh, I'll say that from our perspective, um, many of our communities had never actually truly had access even before the Dobbs decision, even with just the protections of Roe versus Wade. Uh, our work has, has, has always sort of centered around the fact that despite having a legal right, not many people, if, if you don't have the, the, the conditions in your community, uh, the, the, the resources in this country, right, like not everybody has access to healthcare, a human right, and, and if you don't have access to those things, how can you actually, uh, um, you know, enjoy your right to uh, the things that we have on paper. And so I think, I think we, start, we have that starting point, but, but certainly um, losing that floor of the Roe versus Wade protections has created even more uh, difficulties, even more inequities for communities who are already suffering from vast inequities on this issue. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we know is happening uh, as well is that um, so many of our community members, particularly immigrants and, and, and individuals who are in our border states, um, on, even on the, on the U.S. side, um, are unable to, to travel to get the care they need. So if we're looking very specifically at just at um, abortion care, uh, folks who are in Texas, you know, if, if they are immigrants or, and undocumented or, or have mixed status families, can can really not travel uh, outside of those states to get care. And I think that that's a really important thing that's lost in, this, in these conversations we're having about who's, who's able to access care in this moment um, in the US. And I think it, it goes beyond just abortion care, right? I think uh, ma very many communities don't even have access to basic health care, um, even here in the US, and don't, uh, and, and you know, where they had entry points with some of the clinics that were providing some of the reproductive health care, th if those clinics no longer exist, many of them do not exist anymore, um, there's not even that sort of like initial entry point to any kind of health care for many people. Um, I think another thing that I'll, that I'll share, uh, just in, again, this sort of starting point is that um, I think what's what's being lost right now are the stories. I think Katya's story um, is is so impactful and so important in uh, any of the work that we do uh, moving forward. I think I think what uh, what you know as we are sort of moving forward with how do we solve this problem of of reproductive rights and health access in the U.S. Uh, we're thinking a lot about how the stories of those most impacted are are being left behind. We think a lot about um, just, you know. How, how are folks, you know, the sort of larger picture of, of the Roe versus Wade protection, but really like not getting to the, to the, to the story of, of folks who can't actually travel, of folks who can't, uh, who don't have, you know, who never had the basic right or, or access. Um, and, I, and I think that, that that's a really important part of, of what my organization and, and what, you know, our, our movement in reproductive justice is seeking to do it, is really lift that up and ensure that that's, that's what policymakers hear, that's what the media hears, that's what community members hear and know about. And I, and I you know, I'm so grateful to be, to be here today to be able to uh, both elevate, I think, what, what is happening with displaced communities in the U.S., what is happening with communities who have been marginalized for many years in the U.S., uh, as, as, a, as a connection to um, the really important uh, work that's happening at the border to support communities that are displaced there and that are experiencing incredibly difficult situations. I think, I think what I'll just, you know, say, which isn't, isn't, um, I mean, in some in some respects, a happy note. I think that that I think we can do this together. I think it's really important to to be able to connect with our stories, to be able to connect to the fact that we have intersecting movements and intersecting values, and that uh, and the people that we're that we're supporting and trying to help are um, are from very 
the very same communities, and I think we can we can uh, work together to lift their stories, which is a really important part of what we need to do in this moment. Okay, everybody. I know I have a really loud voice, <laughs> so if you want me to talk to you without the microphone, it wouldn't hurt my feelings. I've been asked to do that before. You want to hear me this way or this way? <laughs> With the mic. Okay. Glad to do that. <laughs> oh, yeah, we do have some people way back there. Okay, I'm going to rant and rave, basically. Um, I'm a member of the Angry Tias and Abuelas. We're a group of seven uh, little old ladies that got really mad about what was happening in our backyard down at the Texas-Mexico border. Um, one of the first things we did is uh, a friend of mine got hold of a tape recording of those children crying who had been taken away from their parents. And we got that to ProPublica, it went national, and Pro Trump had to rescind that particular policy. Not that families aren't being separated all the time every day, but that was our first adventure. And we've been as active as we can. Um, we adore the women engineers from Solidarity Engineering, absolutely new concept for us and fabulous for all women and children. And of course, the people that keep us the most inspired all the time are the refugees themselves. You just heard from this incredibly courageous young woman who not only survived, but she helped her child survive, and she's here talking. That's quite extraordinary. Um, I'm gonna uh, just give a summary of the conditions in Matamoros, I mean, the conditions in Reynosa, where I've been working since 2017. Um, I've interviewed thousands of people. I'm a retired attorney, like I said, and I've done the interviews for purposes of trying to get them across so that they can survive even reaching our border area. Our laws have always said, if you need asylum, you go to the, the counter where you turn over your passports and stuff and say, I need asylum, I'm in danger. And the officers shall, that means have to, send them for a credible fear interview and processing, and then they go stay with their families unless they're criminals. The families pay all the bills and stuff while their case goes through the immigration court. That all changed. All of a sudden in 2017, everybody started getting kicked back to stay in Reynosa and stay in Matamoros, where you just saw an event there that was pretty scary. But what was sad for all of us is we were heartbroken for the four Americans that were shot. But we're also heartbroken for the people who were shot, kidnapped, trafficked, and gang raped every 10 minutes over there. Of the thousands I've interviewed over the years, I'm going to guesstimate that 99% have been kidnapped, gang raped, battered, or lost a child in Reynosa since they got there. That's not including everything that happened to them on the way north, which is even worse very often. Um, the Category 4 security assignment that, that Chloe mentioned of being, uh, that's Category 4 is the most dangerous category State Department has. That's what Iraq and Afghanistan have. And there's a reason Reynosa and Tamaulipas are right up there. That's what they deserve to have. Those are gang-held areas, cartel, uh, held areas. They know the refugees don't have any protection there. No one wants them there. No one's going to notice they're gone. And you grab them and hold them hostage or sell them, and you make a lot of money. They don't have money, but their desperate families in the United States are going to go find the money. They'll sell our house. And that we have basically, by forcing everybody to wait over there, we've created a huge pool of money for the cartels. It's a gigantically profitable business to go grab the refugees. Now they wait for the ransom money to come in, and sometimes they say, well, actually, we want a little more, or then they sell them, whatever. So I'm just going to give a few examples of what it's like for women trying to save their kids. Like Katya said, no one makes this trip just for fun. you got to be kidding. No one's up here to buy a new refrigerator or get another job or make some money. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Most women heading north know that they will be raped in all probability on the way north. It's very commonplace now for women to try to get hold of contraceptives or birth control pills before they even start. Many end up with AIDS or other STDs as a result of the rapes on the way north. They're trying to save their children's life, much like her. 
Uh, a young woman that I met at one point had an eight-year-old son. Eight is the new recruiting age, forced recruitment age, by the gangs in most of Central America. So they showed up at her house. She said, no, it's his eighth birthday. No way I'm sending it to him to you tonight. So they left, dragged him out of school, screaming, brought him to the backyard of her house, and in front of her picked up an ax and chopped off his fingers and said, bring him tonight. She didn't. She fled with him. He was still had his fingers wrapped in a bloody bandage when he reached Reynosa, and they were stuck there, being threatened with more kidnapping, more attacks, more everything, terrified. Um, so that's why people come north. Do women have any, uh, any access to any kind of medical care for the attacks, uh, pregnancies, battery illnesses, or anything else that they're going through? No. I mean, there's no, there's no period pack. It's nothing. And no one's going to give it to them if we don't get in there, you know, with solidarity engineers and others and try to scrounge it up. But it goes way farther than that. So I'm going to give um, just three or four case examples as briefly as I can to just illustrate what's going on. A young Haitian woman had to flee Haiti. Uh, they came after her family. She had a young girl who was already a citizen in Florida, a young daughter. So she was hoping it would be easy. She got to the Yucatan, southern Me Mexico, after going through the Darien Pass in Panama, which is absolutely the, it's just a massacre zone for refugees. But she made it through. But she miscarried. She had been pregnant. No medical care, of course, so she just kept going north, hoping for the best, and became ill, but didn't know how ill she was. She reached Reynosa, and some people literally carried her into the shelter where we were working so that at least she'd be off the street because she, she couldn't defend herself at all. And she seemed to have had a stroke. So we frantically you know, called US immigration and said, you know, this woman, it's like you can't make her wait six months in Mexico for permission to cross. It's like she's in terrible shape right now, and she'll never get in the hospital. So they allowed us to cross her, which usually they wouldn't. But we were able to cross her. They took one look at her, took her to a hospital, and she died the next day. She, she died of septicemia. She had an infection from the miscarriage that some antibiotics would have taken care of. This is a beautiful young woman from, from Haiti, six feet tall, everything to live for. But the trip killed her, and basically human cruelty and indifference killed her. Another example. Our, our policy was go back to Mexico and wait your turn to come to the United States. Well, that's not what the law says. Our laws also say you can't send anyone to a place that's dangerous. And while we're telling CBP and Border Patrol officers, don't you dare go to the other side to visit your grandmother. It's too dangerous. We were sending wholesale families back across with small children and leaving them there for years. So one young mother that I knew from Salvador um, she was from a family of police officers, and the gangs had figured out the best way to control a police family is to kill the kids. So they shot, in fact, I guess the elderly mother-in-law in her hammock one day and said to this mom, you have a two-year-old son, he's next, get out of town or else. So she ran all the way north, and she made it to Reynosa, but immediately got caught at the riverfront. And they were kidnapped, her with her little boy, and told that if the father in the United States didn't pay the ransom, they were gonna sell a child for his organs. And the child understood exactly what was said. The money came through, the dad paid in a really big hurry, they ran back to the riverfront um, and got grabbed again. And this time they were you know, kidnapped by one group and then another group came forward and said, no, that's our merchandise uh, with several other families. And a big fight started, and basically the two groups started machine gunning each other in this small room, you know, back and forth with bullets ricocheting. And she said, all of us parents, we just laid our kids flat on the ground and laid on top of them and prayed. Then we ran to the river, swam across, almost drowned, ran to the first border patrol officer we could find and said, thank God, save us. We've been kidnapped twice now and we barely survived. And he said, no, it's not dangerous. You have to go back and wait in Mexico. And he sent them back. This time, she ended up in a camp in Matamoros and was grabbed with her two-year-old son in the middle of the night, thrown in the back of a pickup truck with her two-year-old this distance from her and gang-raped in front of him, and then dumped out bleeding and catatonic in Reynosa, where we were able to get her into a shelter 
I got her the most aggressive lawyer I know. They went to court and screamed bloody murder about, look what you've done to this mother and child. Are you crazy? Let her stay in the US. And the decision was, nah, it's not that dangerous. Send her back. So I was working on get her, getting her into Costa Rica anywhere. She was catatonic and stopped eating. The little boy wouldn't eat either. Um, and they waited for two more years in a tiny apartment we managed to rustle up money for um, because COVID hit. She couldn't go anywhere. So with the sharks circling, they stayed briefly at my house on their way north to family. They're not okay. I don't think they're ever going to be okay. The little boy is beautiful and smart. He's not okay. Case number three, um, a young woman in Guatemala is with her husband and two kids in the back seat, and the gangs are mad at the husband because he won't join, and they machine gun the car. They kill the husband, um, hit the mother who's seven months pregnant with six or seven bullets, but leave the children in the back, the tiny children. Um, people rush up, get the children out of the car, and realize the mom is still alive, so they rush her to a hospital, and she had immediate surgery, but they couldn't get the bullet out of the place just under her cervix. She was too far pregnant. So while they were deciding how to help her with that, people came forward and said, it doesn't matter. She's got to run anyway. The gangs found out she survived and can testify against them. So she jumped out of bed. She could barely walk. She grabbed her two very small children, and they ran all the way to Reynosa and got across the river. I don't know how she swam, but she did. Got the, to the closest CBP officer they could, beg for help, beg for medical attention, beg for help for the children, and they said, "Now nah, you're fine, go back across. So they sent her back. She waited a little bit and then swam again with her two small children and was caught again and sent back again. At this point, she could have had a terrible infection from the bullet wound, and a journalist was so infuriated by her story, he brought her to the sender shelter, and they called me, and we raised holy hell about it, and we're finally able to get her across with her two kids. But at what cost? Um, and then there's the poor woman um, who was with a Haitian family during the really bad freeze just a couple of years ago. Um, no medical care, of course. She just was doing the best she could with her pregnancy. It was freezing. The husband bought a little charcoal stove trying to keep them from freezing to death in one of the tenement buildings and they nearly died of carbon monoxide poisoning and malfunctioned. So they were all standing outside in the freezing wind, vomiting, and my friend Lulu, whom all of us work with very intensively, tried really hard to get an ambulance to come for her or you know, the Red Cross or anybody. No one would come for her. So Lulu finally at 2 a.m. came and got her, threw her in the car, and drove her to the hospital and got her in and said, you better take care of her. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll take care of her. So Lulu went back to her house. Her phone rang, and the woman said, I'm back outside. It's freezing, and I'm still vomiting. They won't let me stay. They say I'm not miscarrying. So Lulu came and got her, raised more hell, got her into a hospital for a few hours, and then they put her out again. So she went back to her apartment building and miscarried. Um, we've had women that, for lack of basic checks, um, not only go into extreme preeclampsia with horrible situations for babies born weighing one kilogram, um, you know, and then are rushed across the border too late. They've already been born, rushed across the border and pouched up as best they can, but it's, it's too late. The damage is done. The damage is done with all of them. The young mother who had stomach cancer um, as I saw when I read carefully through all of her medical papers, but she just kept ha getting handed at the local clinics a slip of paper saying, gastritis, get some anti-acid pills. So it was six months along when I talked to her and noticed the one-liner in the middle of all those pages, and she was in horrible pain and died three days later of stomach cancer that could have been stopped. Um, so am I mad? Yeah, I'm raging, furious, mad. These people are dying. We have absolutely no legal grounds for sending them back at all. This new system of the phone appointments is certainly better. At least people are going to make it to the bridge, and some will get to their family members. But while we're at it, we're setting up all these huge hurdles. Like now you have to, they're saying they're going to require you to apply for asylum in all the countries you stop in. And it's like, well, that's fine. They can get asylum in Mexico. What good does that do? They're going to die there. No one told my father 
fleeing the Holocaust when he was 11 years old. Why don't you go back to Germany, Nazi Germany, and wait your turn? I mean, what the hell is this? So anyway, I'm very angry about this. I'm very grateful for everyone that's being so sympathetic, and I'm super grateful to Solidarity Engineers and for women like Katya that can come forward. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, we went a little over, so we're gonna go into Q and A. Um, but I just just listening to everyone. These are really hard stories to take in. I know it's all really shocking, and we also these really shocking images. But the shocking part of it all is that it's true. And I think what's even worse is that it's not. These aren't three stories, Katya's story. Is that these are thousands of women. This is so normal, and it shouldn't be. Um, yeah. So thank you for sharing that and. Um, uh, Q&A, if anyone would like to ask a question, feel free, we'll pass you the mic. Anyone at all? I have a question for Katya. Um, being in the plaza encampment, um, did you notice a difference in treatment between the, between the men and the women within the camp? Quiero decirle que no vi ninguna diferencia. El trato es igual para todos. I didn't see any differences. The treatment is the same for everyone. My question is, how can the public best support all of your work? Tell your friends. Donate. Follow us on social media, at Solidarity Engineering. I think one of the things that we've tried to do through our social media as the media has disappeared is post as consistently as you can updates. Uh, keep in mind our team is like, we have like seven people, so we're very small for a lot of work, but I would just say, Follow us, follow the photojournalist Vero Cardenas, who is here today, hey Vero. Um, and tell your friends, like I said, I think that we together need to work on changing the conversation around the border from a political issue to a human rights issue. When we first saw, started seeing these camps form in 2017, 2018, 2019, it really was widely seen as a human rights issue large publications like the New York Times were there every month, making it very clear that it was a human rights issue. And unfortunately, over the past three years or two years, that's completely changed. So I would just say, keep following what's going on, share with your friends, and take a critical look at how we're approaching this, because I think there's a tendency to think that this is a party line issue, but in the reality is we're already seeing exponential displacement, like an increase exponentially in displacement worldwide due to things like climate change, like water sc scarcity, which, you know, really exacerbates problems like violence and instability. And so this problem isn't going away. Within 2050, we're going to have well over a billion people displaced. We currently have 100 million, and look how that's being handled. So I think there needs to be some serious shift both in the general public sphere, because then that will then force and put pressure on these larger systems to get it together. Thanks. Lupe, do you have something to add to that as well, speaking from the East Coast or from, you know? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think, um, well, I'll, I'll first invite everybody to uh, sign our solidarity pledge at latinainstitute.org. I think uh, that's a good way to stay connected to the work that we are doing in throughout the US and, and certainly uh, in, in DC and with the administration around many of these issues related to uh, immigrants and, and the experience in the US um, around reproductive rights, health and justice. And um, I think that that's, that's a first step. I think 
um, certainly invite you to, uh, you know, to join in, in, in supporting the cause. Uh, if you can donate, I think that that's always important. I would, I would say for everybody here, um, one of the things that, uh, is it okay if I share our pre-conversation just about resources? Um, this is an issue that, um, that was, as Chloe mentioned, it is not, um, is not being funded um, by uh, uh, organizations that that usually provide this aid. I think certainly, you know, we know in the U.S., communities of color, communities that are marginalized, have always been under resourced and 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 not given the attention and support that we need. And so I think um, we 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 need the support of, of of the community to subsidize our work and to and to really support the the building of power that we that we need to do. Um, I'd say that you know I'll add one last thing that. I think I think beyond sharing the stories, I'm really grateful that um, that we all were able to do that. And certainly, I'm super incredibly grateful for Katya, uh, Katya being here. And and so much of, of what we do at Latina Institute is about uh, building, supporting folks in, in recognizing their power and supporting them and building their power so that they can come to the stage and actually share that share these stories themselves and and advocate uh, for themselves and and lead a lot of these solutions. I think so much of what we know is necessary to be able to create change is that the folks most impacted and affected and living these experiences are able to come to the fore and, and, and press for change and, and, and lead in that. And so um, I think beyond supporting our efforts that, um, you know, I'm an immigrant myself, but I, I've never had the, ex the, the lived experience that many of the people that, that, uh, that we work with and, and, and build their power have. And I think that it's really important to ensure that they're at the fore. Um, and, and joining joining this cause is, is a part of your support to do that. Um, I think we have time for one more. Yeah, hi, thank you for sharing your story. Um, I just would like to ask how much influence in terms of policy-wise that you are able to get the government of that country to support, especially when it comes to the gang, the violence, which is happening in their border um, while we reach out for the support of the country here, um, I'm also interested to know, you know, the, the support of the government on that end um, to see if you get any support at all from them. Thank you. I mean, certainly it's important to give support to us groups that pretty much give 100% of donations back across the border. That, that's what we do, right? Everyone's sitting here. Um, in terms of what's happening in Central America, it's important to know the history a little bit. During the Dirty Wars, the armies massacred, you know, throughout Central America with the death squads, people disappeared. 600 indigenous villages were exterminated in Guatemala in a short period of time in the 80s, which most people don't know about it. 300 people killed in an afternoon. When the war ended, they had already, high level military people had already started getting very involved in the drug stuff because, hey, money. So when they didn't get money from the United States government, which they got throughout the dirty wars, um, despite the legal bans on that, they got it anyway. Um, but then they started needing, you know, new money after the war ended. So they just sort of amped up their, their, their drug business. And they actually started, initiated, trained, grew, et cetera, the group, the Zetas, for example, who were absolutely terrifying. Those came out of Guatemala and you know, were trained and armed uh, and initiated, and they're still under control of you know, former military agents who, who ought to be in jail, but they're not. So people can't just fix their own country, as I often hear. They tried in the 80s, and they were slaughtered, and the United States played a very important role in that. Um, that's in a lot of files. You can go to the National Security Archives with Kate Doyle's stuff and, and read some of those documents, but our government worked very closely with them. Right now, the top level drug lords and stuff, um, are many of those used to work with the CIA, and I'm not making that up. I have those files. They were involved in my husband's murder and torture in Guatemala in the 90s. Um, but so they were getting all kinds of money from the CIA in return for information from people they were torturing, de facto. Um, but once you've worked with the CIA, the CIA will not let anyone go after you. So we're now protecting some of the worst drug lords running people out of Guatemala. 
if I go back in, I'm likely to get thrown in jail because the people in my husband's genocide case um, were on CIA payroll. What can I say? That doesn't make me proud. Um, but so it's very, very complicated. We're protecting the drug lords. We're still working with them because um, they're military people. And the Guatemalan army's always done anything we wanted. They were with us at the Bay of Pigs, 1954. They did this sort of coup and got rid of a reformist president that upset the United Fruit Company. Um, during the Contra War, they let, us, let the United States use all of their military bases and stuff. We work hand in glove together. So we're going to have to get into some really complicated policy issues if we really want to straighten this out. But just saying people should stand up and fix it, well, this morning uh, a, a prosecutor who was a lead prosecutor in a huge genocide case a few years ago that was later annulled is working on another genocide case against another general. He just got thrown in jail this morning. Uh, judges are going to court in bulletproof vests. Um, it wasn't the first time that guy happened to get thrown in jail. He had just got out of jail. Um, in a closely related case, they just ran the judge out of the country. Um, so it ain't easy. I think also I will add to that. Um, in Reynosa, for example, we have been... You have to walk a line, right? Because the government is going to inherently be involved. However, we have found that the government has made our jobs much, much, much more difficult in many instances. For example, when they wanted the plaza closed, the informal camp that Katya um, lived in, they told organizations, basically an ultimatum, build a shelter or, like, build a shelter or we're gonna bulldoze the camp and there's gonna be thousands with literally nowhere to go. And so they basically, you know, spent months and months. Um, this is how I got to know Jennifer Har very, very well is through this whole process. There was a lot of pressure from the government to build the shelter, but there was no offering of resources. The only land they gave us was within the flood zone, which we specifically said, please, please, please do not put us in the flood zone. They put us in the flood zone, so if there's a hurricane, quite literally thousands of people will drown because we are in the flood zone of the Rio Grande Valley where there was a hurricane just two years ago. And then on top of that, we have the governments taking, um, taking ownership of our work, saying that it was theirs, which is difficult. But there's also a long history, as Jennifer was just uh, saying of documented abuses, human rights abuses against the government, from the government against the migrating populations. And this is still relevant. It was just a year ago, I remember sitting in a meeting with like a whole bunch of people from like different levels of the Mexican government and the National Guard and all these people. And they'll look at you deadpan in the eye and be like, well, how we're gonna get people out of the plazas, we're gonna starve them out. And that's that. And so it's really difficult to work with those entities when they're actively not just perpetuating violate, like violence against these populations, but they're advocating for it as well. And they're advocating that the human rights organizations support them in that. And so it's quite complicated. Uh, you have to walk a balance. They are part of a lot of these conversations, but a lot of the time it feels like we are being put in worse positions because of them. And they are the reason, the Mexican Reynosa government is the reason we have been pushed to one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the most dangerous city in a flood zone. That was not by choice. So, yeah. Thanks, Chloe. Um, so, oh, does anyone mind if we take one more? This is not a question, it's a statement. I've been to a number of these talks and this room can really be filled to overflowing. This statement here doesn't really address the issues that you have all collectively uh, been talking about. This is an issue around our southern borders. This room should be filled. And because you've turned it into a woman's issue is not, it's a humanity issue. And it is a policy issue. It is a shame that this room is not packed to the limits. Tell your friends about us. <laughs> it's a little late. Yeah. Well, 
can I can I can I just say I'll Thank just, you, though, for can I, pointing can that I out. Can I offer something to that? I think, you know, I think it's uh, agreed that it's incumbent on, on us to extend an invitation to everybody, but I don't think that this, this statement alone should be an alienating thing to people, and I think so much of the work that we are doing, and I think all of us, is, is about ensuring that there's a recognition that women's issues are everyone's issues, right? And we shouldn't have to say that if we're talking about reproductive rights necessarily, that that's just a women's issue, right? Um, and, you know, there's more work to be done there, absolutely, but, but we're not, you know, just making this statement shouldn't be alienating to people, and I think, and I think we're working to change that, and, and we don't want, you know, uh, I don't want that to be lost, that, that it, it uh, I think that's a, that's a societal problem and not necessarily an us problem. We also will have this recorded, so please, please, please share this recording with anyone who you think would be interested, anyone who has connections to maybe make some impact in this area. We definitely, our priority is to get more help. Like, that's all we can do at this point. Like, we have done everything we possibly can as the border response, and now it's time to bring more actors in. It's a missed opportunity. Hate to say. Well, we can create another opportunity if we need to. I will. I pretty much will open my trap anywhere, anytime, and yell really loudly. So, and I have pretty much nonstop. Just to add a little bit to, and this is something all of you can do in addition to what was just mentioned, right? You know, the most realistic thing, everyone wants to send food and clothing and stuff, and it's like, yeah, they need that. The problem is getting it across through Mexican customs, right? It's like, it's hellish to try to do that. Use clothing we're not allowed to bring. A lot of types of clothes, a lot of types of food we can't bring. Some, um, so what really most urgently needed is cash, and that can be, you know, we can use that to buy food on the Mexican side, which is cheaper, and go to the Tianguis and, and buy used clothing and stuff over there. There's Solidarity Engineers, there's the Angry Tias, there's your organization. Um, we're all front lines. We're not in competition with each other. If they run out of money, we try to find some for them, and, and they build the water towers that keep our folks good. It's like, just do it. And if you want to invite me to come back and, and yap? Hey, all you. right, Jennifer, I'm yeah. sorry, I got to... I got to take that offer to, <laughs> to wrap it up. But if you would like, we would love everyone to join us upstairs to continue the conversation because clearly there's a lot more to be, to be shared. Um, so if you would like to make your way upstairs, we have some snacks and drinks up there. And thank you for coming. Yes, this room should be full, but we're really grateful that you all came. <laughs>